Oh, hi, it's me, Zach Peter, pop culture junkie, reality TV insider, published author, and host of the No Filter with Zach Peter podcast. Here, I'll bring you all the latest news on The Real Housewives, deep dives into celebrity legal scandals, and unfiltered combos with your favorite stars. I've got you covered. And yes, I always keep receipts. So be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for all the latest tea. Now, let's dive in. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? There's no sound. Okay. Sorry, guys. Can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry. I don't know what's going on or why the stream yard has been acting up. Okay. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Yay. Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome on. Sorry about, I don't know why that was acting up, but um, hi, Instagram live stream. Hi, YouTube live stream. What's going on, everybody? We are going to be breaking down the Megan and Harry documentary, the docu-series that has just been released on Netflix, or not just released, but it was released recently. Um, so we'll be breaking down part one, which is episodes one, two, and three. And then next week, we'll be breaking down part two, which is four, five, and six. So everything this week is all leading up or it's like the start of their relationship leading up to the wedding. And the next week we get into the wedding and the aftermath and oof, it is quite, quite an adventure. Um, but hopefully you guys are having or enjoying your no filter wine right now. Is anybody drinking some no filter wine? Let me know which one you have out. StreamYard needs out like Elon. StreamYard is just, it was being a bit of a twat today. Hi, Farah. Hi, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Let me know if you guys watched the Netflix documentary. And also let me know if you were here for Book Club when we originally did the Tom Bauer book, Revenge. So good. Um, okay. So we have a lot to get into in, with the first three parts. Originally I was going to do all six parts and then I realized there's a lot of content in these parts. So, you know, we're probably going to have to try to get as much of it as we possibly can. Yay. Hi, couch, couch stepping. Okay. So like I said, we're only going to get through the first three parts today. And then I was also thinking since we are, I feel like since we are, starting to dip out of book club like maybe we rename our tuesday night instead of book club maybe we call it like um you know real recaps or no filter reviews something that like alludes to the fact that like we recap and review things and like debunk it at the same time so if anybody has like some fun names for what the oh elaine's drinking some i always make it nice white wine i love it um, I'm glad you're giving us the tea. I don't want to watch the Megan and Harry documentary. So we'll get into it. We'll talk about what the documentary shows us, what Tom Bauer talked about in his book and kind of the comparison between the two. Yep, watched it. She's a piece of work. Yes, get ready because we're going to get into all of that. Watched it and she is a total piece of work. Oh, okay, so nobody likes Megan after watching this. I watched it and ended up liking them more after seeing it all. Okay, I, I want to talk about that too because there were moments where I was like, oh, here for Tom B but didn't watch the network's Netflix. Okay, well, it's okay. I'm going to break it down for you. But I I'm thinking, um, I do want to rename our Tuesday nights and instead of calling it book club, because at first it was Bravo book club and then we stopped doing just Bravo books. And now we're doing books and documentaries and Holly Madison has a new documentary called Playboy Murders. that's going to be coming out in January that I thought might be kind of interesting to do, you know, rewatch with Zach. Oh my God. Rewives with Zach Peter. Could you imagine if I copied Bethany Frankel's podcast, the Hagen and Mary show? I've watched all six episodes twice. If they want privacy, they need to shut up. Um, okay, let's get into it. But let me know if you guys do have fun uh, ideas for names. And then also, I was wondering, I'm thinking of maybe releasing the No Filter Tuesday Talks. Yes, but I want to allude to the fact that these are like recaps and reviews of 
different pop culture things, right? So whether that's a book or whether that's a uh, Jen Shaw sentencing briefing or whatever, like I want to, you know, I don't know. We'll come up with a fun name, but just start start noodling on it. Maybe in January we can announce that our Tuesdays will have a different name. It's interesting interesting to see how conflicting the opinions are. I watched it and sympathized with Megan and Harry. Okay, good. So let's get into it. Mental breakdown or pop culture topics you decide. Real pop review. Oh, I kind of like real pop review. Pop rewind. Well, it's not a rewind. It's a review, right? Pop review. Tuesdays are our, our Tuesday pop review or Tuesdays pop recap. I don't know. We'll think on it. And I'm also thinking of maybe starting to release these on the main podcast feed instead of just on the lives. So that might be something interesting. So just like people, when they listen to a recap, they kind of listen to it like in the car or on their go. And that's not always easy to do on YouTube. So whatever you call it, I'm here for it. Well, thank you. Okay, so let's get into it. Megan and Harry documentary on Netflix, episode one. So part one, or sorry, episode one really, or I guess part one too. Episode one really focuses on their love story, how they met and everything leading up to their wedding. The royal family declined to comment for the documentary, but it seems like according to Elle, they're very unhappy with it, especially Prince William. Uh, and he seems to be upset according to their sources about the way that his mother, Princess Diana, was used throughout the documentary, and especially the use of her tell-all BBC interview, which we've now discovered that Diana was manipulated and tricked into giving that interview because the reporter was using fake documents and like fake, fake statements to make her believe that the palace was secretly plotting against her, and so she felt like she had to actually like tell her truth. So Prince William is not happy about the fact that they used clips from that interview in the documentary to tell their side of the story. Um, and to really make this comparison. Netflix didn't contact the royal family properly. I'm pretty sure if Netflix wanted a comment from the royal family, they would have gotten a comment from the royal family. They cannot comment against protocol. Yeah, I wasn't expecting them to comment either, but it definitely seems like Netflix did put that disclaimer out there that they were approached and declined. And I will say, you know, it just... <sighs> um. So let's get into it. We open up with bits of Megan and Harry's 2020 video diaries, okay? How did we end up here? And this is basically like them telling their own story via their iPhones about quitting the royal family. So these videos already tell us right off the bat that this series had been brewing since 2020 when they were leaving the royal family. So this is likely when in my head, I'm like, okay, so this is when they started to pitch the series and they needed bits of their story to sell to different networks or wherever. They claimed that it was a friend that told them that they should document their truth and they should document their side of everything that they were going through. That way they have that. So immediately, like, it's not like a personal diary. They're both like doing their own little confessionals on their iPhones, which again, in my brain is like, oh, they're trying to put this together so that they can sell it. And then, of course, their Netflix, their Netflix deal was announced in September 2020. So then they had their Oprah interview, which was in March 2021. So they were definitely building up to this. And this was obviously the end goal from the beginning um, of when they were leaving. But they say that nobody knows the full truth. We know the truth. The Institute knows the truth. And the media knows the truth. I'm like, okay, so then how is it that nobody knows the truth? If you know it, the palace knows it, and the media knows it, but nobody knows the truth. Okay, cool, got it. But then we get, um, they show us a 2015 interview. One of the, I don't know, it's unclear if this is a producer or somebody that's part of the production crew, but they show Megan this interview where she gets asked about whether or not, and this is from 2020, or sorry, from 2015, whether she would... Like, who would you rather, basically? Prince William or Prince Harry? And she didn't know who to choose. She's like, I don't know. I don't really care. Um, Harry, I guess. Which already tells me they're trying to paint the picture that she has no clue who Prince Harry is and no clue who Prince William is and has no real interest in them and can't really be bothered by any of this. How do you become a member? I can't find the join button. Um, Tiki, in the description underneath the video, there should be a link to become a member of the Zach Pack. Um, okay, so they tr let us know she has no clue who Prince Harry is. And this clearly contrasts Tom Bauer's book Revenge, which we broke down in our book club, which shows that she was a lot more calculated and she intentionally chose Harry because she wanted to have that celebrity high life. They say that this series is to let people in on a glimpse of what they of what really happened and who they really are. 
and they say, well, does it make more sense to hear our story from us? Which I believe is a very valid point. Okay, what is your story? Tell us who your story is. Let's dive in. What is your story? So we open up about her talking about how she's a single girl living a single life. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world and I'm single and ready to jingle is basically what she's selling us. She wanted to go on a hot girl's trip and they were going to party together and have fun and get drunk and just be wild and single and, you know, young and dumb and free. So then Harry saw Megan on Instagram and he thought that she was very pretty and he was immediately very interested. And it was a very modern love story that started on Instagram. He then reached out to a friend and a friend introduced them and they immediately hit it off. Um, I think that their love story is actually kind of cute. I think the Instagram part is a little basic, but they clearly love each other and, you know, they are into each other and you can tell that they have a genuine connection. Um, you can tell that he fell head over heels for her, like head over heels for her. They give us a glimpse into his childhood, okay? This is where we kind of start off with building where Harry came from. He says that he remembers being swarmed by paparazzi growing up and that they were always told, don't react, don't feed into it. That's the advice they were given. Do your part, live with it. This is what we signed up for. This is what they want. Just don't react and don't give them anything. And then they have nothing to use. This episode really stresses the importance of the royal family in Great Britain. We see lots of pressures from the paparazzi, especially with Diana. Diana is in the documentary a lot. You would think that she was married to Meghan and Harry with how often they feature Diana. They claimed that it was so bad for Diana. And then when she got divorced, Diana became an even bigger target. He says that he doesn't remember much about his mother, but he does remember her laugh the most. So he kind of talks about, we don't really hear him talk about his relationship with um, Prince William very much at all. We see clips of him as a kid. He talks a lot about his mother. Doesn't really talk about his relationship with the queen all that much. Talks about how many girls got driven away by the media of dating Harry, which I get. It's understandable. Royal life is no, cake, is no, it's no cakewalk. Harry says that Meghan is a lot like Diana even though, like I just mentioned, he said earlier, he doesn't really remember much of his mom. He said that he just remembered her distinct laugh. So it's interesting that he thinks that Megan is a lot like Diana and that they would be thick as thieves. They would be BFFs if Diana were still here today. He says that he had to protect his family because he doesn't want history to repeat itself. So here we go, crafting the Diana is just like Megan narrative. And we're going to get into all of that just We'll get into the Megan and the Diana stuff. But the pressure of being in the royal family does appear to be very insane. I'll give them that. I can definitely have sympathy for the fact that it's a lot. And it's not easy. It's not an easy job. And not everybody could do it. It's not a life for everybody. That made me feel so sorry for Harry growing up this way. Yes, I agree, Aaron. And I, too, this pulled on my heartstrings as well. This is making me lose faith in documentaries after watching the Casey Anthony documentary and now watching this documentary and just the producing and a lot of it because this was definitely made to make you feel for Harry growing up. And I'm curious, Eric, if that same pull of the heartstrings, if you felt that same way when we got Megan's upbringing and Megan's childhood because they gave us very different versions of their upbringings and their childhood, right? So paparazzi was intense on Harry, especially as he got older painting him as a bad boy, a party boy, whatever. A lot of his upbringing is focused on the pressures of being royal and dealing with the paparazzi and how it was so unfair. And it was just, it wasn't, you know, it was hard. Then we get into their dating story. We get back to their dating story because it jumps back and forth quite a bit throughout the series. Megan and Harry, who they refer to each other as M and H. I thought that that was kind of cute. I think, you know, celebrities, whether you're an assistant or you work, you work around them, you often refer to them by initials. Um, I remember when I used to work with like Jenny and Donnie, it was always JM, DW. So I think it's it, it was cute that they refer to each other as an M and H. And I think it's probably also like a confidentiality thing. Um, that they probably started with where she was texting her friends about H and then it kind of just became his nickname. So Megan and Harry apparently only met in person twice, but most of their communication was all via text and it was via FaceTime. Their work schedules were very hectic, but he invited her to Botswana for five days where they would live together in a tent. I don't know if I could have done that after meeting somebody only twice. Camping for five days with elephants right outside the tent does not sound ideal. But apparently she was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let me give it a chance. 
and she agreed and they did it and they fell even more in love with each other and if that's not a true make or break moment i don't know what is i mean this is what technically the third time that they were physically together and they were dating or they were together in a tent in the middle of nowhere i wonder if they banged at that point like do you guys think they were sleeping with each other it definitely doesn't seem like they were sleeping with each other the first time the first two times that they met but i mean you're staying in a tent together i'm sure there's got to be either you are really not into him or like this had to have been when we popped the cherry right sorry total weird side note <laughs> As they continued to date, they implemented a two-week rule where they couldn't go two weeks without seeing each other. It was a long-distance relationship that tends to make sense to have some sort of security within their relationship. He was living in the UK. She was living in Toronto, shooting suits. He was obviously fulfilling royal duties out in Great Britain. So it does kind of make sense. Then we get snippets of the British press being racist towards her and the pressures of tabloid culture. We see bits of Meghan possibly being from the wrong side of the tracks. And there was a headline that mentioned that she was almost straight out of Compton. And listen, tabloid culture is awful. Um, that's where we end with episode one is kind of like the mounting pressures of tabloid culture, which is interesting because I'm trying to understand what story we're telling because we get Harry's sad childhood, you know, living in the royal family, right? We get Diana quite a bit. We get Meghan and Harry meeting. Um, we get tabloid culture, a lot of tabloid culture. But their relationship still was under wraps at this point. Like, we're, we're giving the backstory about Harry and we're giving the initial story of how they met. So I don't understand why we're really shoving this tabloid culture was terrible story so early out, right? Fresh out the gate, life was hard for Meghan and Harry. But let's, you know, tell you the beginning of their story. But it was hard for them later on. But let's get to the beginning of the story. But just know it gets hard for them. Like, we're already drilling that into our brains. So very early on here, the palace doesn't know about them yet. The media doesn't know about them yet. Yet here we are driving how unfair life is going to be for them in the near future. Then we conveniently leave out a giant elephant in the room. Okay? As cute as their love story is... We forget to mention the fact that when Meghan met Harry, she was dating hot chef Corey Vitello. Did we forget about that? We, like, we completely forgot to mention her boyfriend, Corey, while he was living with her at the same time. Also, the whole part about how they only met uh, twice, we also leave out the part that after their first date, Harry apparently flew to Toronto to stay there for a week to visit Megan. He wasn't allowed to stay with her, obviously, because Corey was still living there and she didn't tell him that. But we're hearing that she was fully single and not looking. Well, yeah, she wasn't looking because she was dating somebody. This was the end of poor Corey or hot Corey, Chef Corey. This was the end of their relationship. But it's very strange that right out the gate, they're like, Megan was single, completely single. We have no even mention. She doesn't even talk about, I was just going through a breakup, so I wanted to be single, right? We don't even get that. We just completely negate the fact that Corey was around and that Corey was still living with her. Why not even talk about, be like, hey, listen, we were on a break. We were broken up. I wanted to get rid of him. Um, but he wouldn't leave yet. We were still trying to figure out, you know, if he was going to end up moving out or whatever. But I was like, wow, we just completely forgot to mention that at all. Completely had no idea she had a boyfriend. Yes, she had a boyfriend. Poor Corey. Yeah, poor Corey. But this is why I'm like, you're already not being honest with us right out the gate, right? Then we get into episode two, and this is where we get into more of Megan's upbringing. And so Megan's mom now gets introduced into this. And so Megan's mom introduces herself and then opens up with the last five years have been challenging, almost as if she knew that's exactly what the documentary was supposed to be about. Like, why not just open it up with, hi, I'm Megan's mother, Doria. That would have been suitable right away. Introduce yourself. Cool. But why are we introducing it and being like, but the last five years have been really challenging. Again, already setting us up for this narrative. And then we get reminded again that the media is awful and they did terrible things and they said terrible things about Megan on, on social media and in the press. It's just coming from all ends. And episode two is very big on showcasing how great Megan is. Her her philanthropy, which based off of Tom Bauer's book seemed a lot more performative than it was genuine. She was doing a lot of these photo ops 
you know, Doria definitely seemed poached. I mean, she did seem a little co- coach. Her mom is an enabler. But, like, listen, wouldn't you be an enabler, too? Like, your daughter's now with a prince. Like, yeah, I would be like, yeah, let me ride that elephant. And I'll, yeah, what, they were awful to you? Yes, I'll... Well, listen, when it's your baby, like, of course, you're going to defend your baby girl. You're, of course, you're going to, you know, protect your kid and back their story or whatever the case may be. And if it comes with the perks of royal life, Dory's living that life. Megan's mother and Harry, not that it's a, not that it's bad, but she makes him feel safe. Yes. And in Tom Bauer's book, the impression that I got was that Harry definitely had some serious mommy issues and that Megan was filling that void. And it kind of seemed like she knew what she was kind of aware of the fact that he had those issues and that she was able to provide that safety for him. I'm thinking she banged him at his place in the first visit. She tested him out before she agreed to be stuck with him for a long camping trip. Yeah, you're not going to go into, you know, the middle of nowhere, into the jungle with a guy for five days if the dick isn't great. Like, at least at that point, you know, you know, he's got good boyfriend dick. I don't think Harry has a big dick. I think he has good boyfriend dick. Um, okay, so we get a lot of her philanthropy. Finally, the news, we we get a little preview of the news of their dating starting to come out, and Megan's immediately embraced by the media, right? They love her. They think this is great. They think this is exciting. But then all of a sudden, the paparazzi starts to come over to Toronto, and they're following her every move. And Megan then talked about how she was very fair-skinned, so she remembers people assuming that her mother was the nanny. Tom Bauer wrote in his book that there was really only one account where he was able to to find that that actually happened. But my thing is kind of like, listen, I'm sure it happened more than once. You can't fact check every single instance like that when it happens. So I'll give it to Megan on that. I'm sure that her mother did face a lot of discrimination growing up. Um, But it's just interesting that we very much make that a point. Though her mother makes it clear to Tom Bauer in his book that they didn't come from a bad part of LA and there wasn't a major threat growing up. And and at least from what she told Tom, she didn't feel like that was a big issue that Megan struggled with. Um, and from what we heard from the interviews that Doria and her father Thomas gave to Tom Bauer in the book, they both seemed to really try to make sure that race wasn't a thing for Megan and that she always felt loved and she always felt embraced and she was always surrounded by you know people of different cultures. Megan said that when her parents split, though, she went to go and live with her mother. I don't remember that necessarily being the case. I remember in the book, it says that she kind of bounced back and forth, that she lived with both of them, but she makes it seem like they distanced themselves from her father and that she was staying with Doria most of the time. Mom says that she was raised by a strong group of women. Not to mention, there's no real mention of Megan's dad. Um, he comes up later on, but there's no, he comes up later on when he's relevant to being talking to the press. But at least early on, we don't get much about him in her upbringing or her childhood. We get to see her childhood school, the Hollywood Little Red House. Her former principal then comes out and meets Megan for the first time after all of these years. And she shares this note that Megan wrote to her when she graduated and left the school. And in the note, it says, when I am rich and famous, when I write my life story, I will talk about you and you will be known worldwide, which definitely speaks to her aspirations, definitely speaks to her ambitions. She clearly wanted a big life and she was definitely already starting to manifest that from a very young age. That's not to say that she was super calculated in this, but, you know, definitely says that she had her sights set on having a big life, an extravagant life. And she definitely made that happen. Her dad is so cringe. Her dad is very cringe. And we'll get into the cringe of her dad. We'll get into her dad when he comes up more in the documentary. But at least for now, in her childhood upbringing, we don't have a whole lot. Come on, Megan would bang Harry even if he had the worst dick, all the money and all for the money and fame. Is that, I mean, I guess, I guess vibrators can make up for that, right? Just joining, just starting to watch this documentary. Okay, well, we're get we're breaking down episodes one, two, and three right now. We're right in the middle-ish of episode two. So, um, okay, she talks about how she wrote a letter 
for a dish soap commercial where she asked the brand to ditch the word women in their marketing and instead say people because women aren't the only ones that wash dishes. All people wash dishes. And that got featured and the brand changed their messaging, which also kind of fits the theory that she learned from a very young age how to gain attention by doing social justice work. Also a point Tom Bauer tries to make in the book that seems to kind of also be supported by this story that she shares about how, you know, she, I mean, do we really believe that I forgot what the brand was, but do we really believe that she changed, she got them to change their messaging? I don't know. I mean, it's a cute story though. And it got featured. So was she just, you, did she learn how to gain attention by doing social justice work from a young age or was it always in her? Was it something she used to make herself known? I guess it depends on how you look at it, really. Was it genuine or performative? I think it's really somewhere in the middle. I think it's a little bit of both. I think she probably liked to give back, but also liked the perks of getting recognition for giving back, right? The episode really focuses on how great Megan is, though. She got straight A's. She did a lot of charity work. She was the smart girl. She was talented in theater. We didn't get any of this with Harry. All we got was how hard his childhood was. We don't hear about his schooling. We don't hear about his ambitions were growing up. We don't go see him talk to his old principals. All we focus on is the tragedy of his mother and the pressures of the paparazzi. So we're definitely selling a, a narrative here that Megan was a good girl and Harry was struggling with royal life. So that's why I asked you, Aaron, when you were saying my heart broke for Harry, how did you feel? But she wants to be Oprah. Yeah. How did you feel? when we're getting her side of things, you don't have that same like, oh my God, I feel so bad for her. Life was so hard for her. We get this, oh no, she was loved and she was embraced and she was such a good girl and she was such a smart girl and she was doing charity work. Like it was very Jen Shaw of her, right? Saving the world. So Megan talks about, she brings up a story about how she remembers the N-word being yelled at her mother on freeway. She said that the UK, though, was really where race became a thing. She said that she genuinely never thought about race before. She had a fair complexion, but she was never really judged for being mixed, having a black mom and a white dad. They then reference an article about how Megan was almost straight out of Compton, which sounds awful. I wish we would get more context into what these lines actually were. Um... Not that it makes it right at all. I'm just saying, like, I wish I knew what the narrative the article was trying to paint was or the story that they were trying to sell. Did they think that this was a cheeky joke or were they trying to make an intentional thing? It still doesn't make it right. I just, I wish there was more context behind these headlines that we're seeing. Because oftentimes headlines tend to be clickbait and they tend to be like shock value and they tend to just hook you in, right? It's so great. My daughter is so happy. Oh, that's awesome, Stacey. Um, I didn't feel for Megan. I just felt like it was a little much. Didn't seem completely honest, but I still like her. Yeah, but we definitely made her seem like she was quite the same growing up. In the palace, the party line, when you're getting beaten up in the press, it's no comment. Don't engage. Don't react. Don't add gas to the fire. And I feel like Megan and Harry at this point have really become like a gas station. And they're just like, let's add all the gas to all the fire and blow it up. So the press was getting brutal. The palace wanted to ignore it. Again, we kind of jump around back and forth. We're talking about them and their public life. The palace was like, listen, ignore it. You know, this happens with all members of the royal family. It's confusing why we keep jumping back and forth between Meghan's childhood and then the pressures of royal life. We haven't really gotten into her public life with Harry yet. So it is interesting that we do have this back and forth. I would just think if we're going to go in chronological order, then let's start with their, maybe let's start with their love story opening up and how hard things are now. And then be like, let's take it back to the beginning. And then episode one could focus on their childhoods and what their upbringings were and maybe how they were different. And Harry came from mon money. And well, I guess Megan did come from money too, because her father was very successful. But, um, you know, like talk about like what their experiences were growing up, how they were similar, how they were different. And then by the end of it, talk about how they met. And then in episode two, we can talk about how their relationship started to blossom. And then in episode three, we can get into what it was like when they came out publicly. And then in episode four, we can get into the wedding and we can continue down that road. Whereas we keep going back and forth. And we're trying to, to put messages in the audience's mind without allowing us to build or come up to our own structure. The UK is not as racist as the US. No, no way. Okay, we're gonna get into that. We're in episode two, right? Talking about how hard things were. 
um, and how she was really angry that the palace didn't speak up and try to defend Megan when the pressure started to rise. And then I really thought about this and I was like, I kind of get it. Like at this point, Megan was just Harry's girlfriend of a few months, right? Because at the beginning when they were first dating, we couldn't really talk about it because she was dating Chef Corey. But so at this point, she was just Harry's girlfriend that lived in another country. And we're leaving out that context as to the scrutiny that was coming at the beginning, right? Or why people were interested in her, why they were digging into her background and why they wanted to know who she was. So was there an expectation that you have to protect every girl that Harry planned to bring home? Because that feels a little unwarranted. That feels a little weird. Like, let's take it to the U.S., right? In the White House, for example. I remember Bush's daughters were painted at these crazy party girls, right? As was Harry. And so, like, if they dated someone, let's say Barbara was dating someone, and the press was making a ruckus about it, is it then the White House's responsibility, the, pre the press secretary for the White House, is it their responsibility to issue a statement on behalf of Barbara's boyfriend if the National Enquirer was dragging him? Like, is that a fair understanding that, like, that's how they would use their public-issued statements was to defend Barbara's boyfriend? Like, that's literally, at this point in time, who Megan was. Megan was some American actress that lived in Toronto that had just started dating Harry for under a year. Again, this context is completely left out. Sorry, Zach, I'm having Harry and Megan fatigue. It's incredibly infuriating how they're gaslighting people. They, they're blatantly lying and expecting people to believe them. Yes. So we're given this story now when Megan is known as the Duchess, right? She's known as Harry's wife now. She's known as, as the mother of Harry's children now. But this was apparently happening when she was just Harry's girlfriend living in Canada. So I kind of understand why the palace wasn't quick to issue a statement on behalf of the new girlfriend of one of the princes, particularly the prince that happened to be a party boy. <sighs> it doesn't make what the press was saying right. I want to be clear about that. But let's also be clear, these weren't prestigious publications either. These were gossip rags. It's basically like the National Enquirer. They're garbage magazines that live for the gossip and the low-budget stories. They're trying to sell papers, and so they're, they're going to write anything that gets people's attention. It's still wrong. I'm not saying what they were printing was right, but it's why I don't bother to read those types of press publications. It's bottom-of-the-barrel garbage. Like You can't have a high bar for a low-brow magazine. But I also want to be clear, like the way that they treat people is not nice. Nice. It's ruthless and toothless. It's it's not right. The whole tabloid culture, I think, is awful. But it's still, unfortunately, what you sign up for when you decide to become, you know, when you decide to open yourself up to the public. And I think it comes with the royal life. That's different in comparison to celebrities, though, because I feel like celebrities, you know, they want the attention. But with the royal family, and they want the attention, and they can also kind of filter it and filter what they want to keep out of the public, even though things will continue to slip into the public because there is public interest. However, the royal family is paid for by the public. Their life is paid for by the people. So while I don't like it, I also understand the Commonwealth's sense of entitlement to want to know about their personal lives because they feel like they are part of their personal lives and they're paying for their personal lives. They're paying for their security. They're paying for this shit. They paid for Harry and Meghan's renovations. And then we get this quote from Harry that I think is really interesting. They're born into Meghan chose it. Exactly. That's a great point, jo uh, Joma, Jo Marie. Megan chose to come into this life. I can have a little more sympathy for Harry because like Aaron was saying, he didn't, he was raised in this. He grew up in this. Um, the British press is cruel. So is the American press. Like this is tabloid culture. That's the part that I'm like, oh. <laughs> Megan and Harry are telling the truth, but every truth has three sides. There's those they speak of and what happened. It's sad that, two brothers are not as close as where they are. I agree with that. Um, but here's the, here's an interesting thing in relation to that comment, actually. Is Harry made a very interesting statement in his confessional. He says, we don't see the world the way it is. We see the world the way we are. And I think that's true. I think Meghan and Harry see themselves as victims. And that's why, and that's what they're trying to sell us with this documentary. After watching this, I have a new appreciation for both of them and what they went through. I don't. I really don't. 
Um, so smart. She never realized it was appropriate to curtsy to the queen. Okay, we'll get into that. This is not a documentary. Documentaries are facts. This was purely a PR series. There is no balance. I agree. The same thing with the Casey Anthony documentary on uh, on Peacock. Toronto is part of the English land. Oh, interesting. Um, it's not just the tabloids. It's every TV show, every newspaper, every blogger attacking them. Is it? Or is that just what they're telling us? Because we go back and forth between them being embraced by the media and being embraced by the Commonwealth. And let's not forget the fact that they were very much embraced here in the U.S., very much so. Just because somebody says something in a documentary and there aren't facts to back it up doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case. You can say the same thing about a housewife. Uh, I don't know. Pick one. Lisa Vanderpump. Lisa Vanderpump can say... I am beaten up by the press every day and I'm beaten up on social media every day. And if you go in the press and you read articles and you look at magazines and you go on social media, you're going to find negative things that are said about Lisa Vanderpump. Does that mean that she's relentlessly hounded by the media? No, that means this is the story that I'm willing to tell. And I think any type of public person has both sides of it. You get loved and you get hated on. And I think in this case, they tell us both, but they really try to lay it in that the, the scrutiny is a lot worse. They're completely playing the victim. I agree with you, Adam. I think they're playing the victim. Never know what to believe, honestly. It's hard because in these documentaries, you want to believe them. You want to believe that it was so hard on them. But then it does feel like these documentaries are becoming less about being documentaries and telling us the story. Documentaries are supposed to be about the truth, right? Let's give you all the facts and let you come to your own conclusion. But the difference is documentaries now have become a part of, have become essentially reality shows, PR stunt reality shows that are meant to be sold to you as something with more prestige. Again, we don't see the world the way it is. We see the world the way we are. I think Megan and Harry see themselves as victims and that's what they wanted to sell. And they're using Netflix to sell that. It's nice to see Harry opening his eyes. Um, and it's nice to see him starting to embrace his family as being mixed. I think it seems very genuine on his part. Like he wants to be a better person. He wants to be, you know, he wants to kind of deconstruct some of those old conditionings that he was raised with for his kids. I find that very endearing. I think Megan genuinely wants to raise her kids without that, you know, I mean, let's be honest, the Roy the, the UK, there are racial undertones, just like there are here in the US. We're breaking out of that. We're growing, we're evolving. And I think that there's a genuine desire to grow and evolve, evolve from both of them. But I also do feel like there is a bit of PR in this as well. I think they have a very precious love story. I'll give them that. I like Megan and Harry as a couple very much. They're one hell of a cute couple. I just wish we got more of that because it's Megan and Harry, right? But there's a lot of lecturing. There's a lot of comparing to Diana. There's a lot of look at how mean everybody was is to us. And we get that relentlessly in every single episode, at least in the first three episodes. And I know it's only going to get worse in the next three episodes. Megan then talks about, you know, her dad a little bit and being a daddy's girl growing up, but she struggled splitting between two households. I was able to relate to that. It's hard when you split between different households. I think people think that it's it's not so bad because you have more, right? Because you have two households. You get two Christmases and two Thanksgivings and double the everything. But I actually think I feel for her because instead of getting more, you're really only getting bits. And you're never really getting a full house to hold you, right? Not one household. You have two households. And you are just getting bits of each one. You know, I remember growing up, I would stay with my grandparents a lot and I would stay at my mom's house and I would visit my aunt on the weekends. And occasionally I would go and visit my dad on the weekends. So I get it when she talks about feeling lonely growing up because she was splitting her time between two households, despite how much her parents wanted to make her feel loved. You're naturally going to feel that way. Then we get back to the paparazzi and listen, the paparazzi are brutal it's insane. I've always thought paparazzi culture was insane, but that's why Lindsay Lohan left the U.S. and she decided to go and move to Dubai, where there is no paparazzi in Dubai. Meghan and Harry did not leave the U.K. to go live in Dubai where there's no paparazzi. They came to the U.S. and they came to Hollywood. So, yes, the paparazzi are awful. They don't see people as humans. They see you as money that they can earn. They see you as a cash grab. But the paparazzi game is not something that was invented when Meghan Markle started to date Prince Harry. I think paparazzi culture is terrible, but it's nothing new. Maybe that's just my head growing up in Los Angeles, but I'm not wildly shocked by their interest in the royals. 
you know, especially the Commonwealth being interested in them because they're paying for their lives. Clicking actually Twitter just came to mind and there was no, there was the no hate campaign. And that was Twitter telling us that Zach Commonwealth, the word I was looking for Toronto is in Canada. Yes. Um, Diana's tell all 1992 seems like their story in 2022, but that's why I tend to believe them. Yes. But now we're also realizing that Diana told that story, that tell all interview was manipulated. And that's why Prince William was upset that they're even using that tell because even Harry himself, what last year in 2021 condemned that interview because she was manipulated and tricked into believing that the palace was against her. So that's why she came and told her story. And listen, when somebody's already told that story. It's easy to take notes and to cheat off of the notes that are already out there. There are very big differences between Princess Diana and Duchess, uh, Duchess Kate and Duchess Meghan. Um, I think the bigger challenge with their relationship is not so much the paparazzi at the beginning, but it was more of the long distance. I think that was the really hard part for Megan. And we don't really talk much about that. Um, I think dealing with having the, a lot of paparazzi scrutiny without having her man by her side, I think that's tough. She didn't have an anchor with her. And that, I imagine, would be challenging. But let's also be clear. She wanted to be an actress. She grew up in Hollywood. She wanted to pursue a life in the public eye. Now she got it, you know? It's like you're making a deal with the devil. Careful what you wish for. She... um. Then she talks about meeting the royal family for the first time. I thought that that was cute and endearing. He says that she, that the family was very impressed by her. She talks about having to meet the queen and being nervous and having to curtsy. And then she kind of like makes like a little joke of like when she curtsied, she over curtsied. A lot of people took offense to that. I personally didn't take that much offense to it, but I can, you can, you know, you can just tell she's an American girl in a British world. You know, where things are just very different and culturally it's very different. But it also seems to be pretty clear that the issue that they had with her early on was more about her being an American actress. And that was more of the biggest hesitation with her dating Harry is she was an American actress. She came from Hollywood. She walks red carpets. She's like that girl. Not so much about her being mixed race. Then we get into her acting career. And she says the acting was really hard because it weighed on her self-esteem and she was a mixed race. So she didn't feel like she really fit in anywhere. Um, but also let's be clear that like acting will be heavy on any self-esteem. Like it, it, the entertainment industry is brutal for anyone and everyone. It's constant rejection all the time, especially when you're an auditioning actor or actress. Most of the time it's about who you know more than anything else or more about who you're willing to sleep with. That's the ugly reality of Hollywood. Her friends said that she wasn't meant to be an actress, that she was actually meant for bigger and better things. She also talks about her schooling and she double majored in theater and international relations, which to me struck me kind of interestingly because in the last episode, we just talked about how she had no clue who Prince Harry and Prince William were, yet she was studying international relations. You would just think someone that studies international relations would have a pulse on international culture. And I feel like when you think of the British and you think of the UK, there's no more culture than when it comes to the Queen of England and Princess Diana and Princess Diana's two boys. Harry and, and William. Do you think the paparazzi is more ruthless with Harry and Meghan or William and Kate and why? I think Meghan and Harry add fuel to the fire and that's why the press is bigger on them. Honestly, I think William and Kate followed by the British rules and they're like, let's keep our head down. Let's not make any waves. Let's just do what we have to do and we'll cry behind closed doors. Harry and Meghan are not that way. Harry and Meghan are very much out there. And here's the thing. I think Diana was also very smart when it came to how she utilized the press. I don't think Meghan and Harry are smart. I think Meghan and Harry are pulling in the victimhood. It breaks my heart to see where Harry has landed in all of this. It does. It does. Um, I like how invested everyone is. I'm just not that into the Royals, but I enjoy listening. I enjoy listening too. And I enjoy the juxtaposition of everyone's different viewpoints with all of this. Some people really like the Royals and empathize with them. Some people really don't like the Royals and hate them. William and Catherine is made into saints and Harry and Meghan are treated like villains. I've read and seen everything about Diana and the Royal family. Um, I don't know if that's, I mean, but again, when you poke the bear, the bear is going to bite back. That's why the Brit the Brits were saying, like, just don't add fuel to the fire. It's already going to be scandalous that Megan is an old is older. 
not an old woman, but she's not a 19 year old that they're used to coming and in and, and marrying into the family. She's an American actress. Like the fact that she's an actress, that's already salacious. The fact that she's American, oh, she's not British. You know, it's like all of these things definitely didn't help. Her. She's already been divorced, married and divorced. You know, there's a lot. Um, then we get into the TIG, which was uh, Megan's version of like goop or poosh. And despite how aspirational others described her, she says that all she really wanted to do was volunteer and do more charity work. Then we jump over into the engagement, which I thought was cute. Very low key, very sweet. Harry definitely seems to be like a simple guy who's not into the glam of it all. He's not into the royal life. He's just not into all of that. And it seems like you know, to these other points that people are making, people were very excited about the engagement. They seem to have embraced Megan quite a bit when the engagement first happened, which is interesting given that they make it seem like the press was only harassing them. It seems like they got a lot of love, even though they also maybe got some tough scrutiny. So it was a mixed bag, but they did get a lot of love and continue to get a lot of love. You know, how many other people leave the royal family to get a, a multi-million dollar Netflix deal and Spotify deal and book deal, multi-book deal? Like, listen, it comes with the good and it comes with the bad. And if you want a private life, then leave. Go back to Toronto where paparazzi aren't really. Go to Dubai where paparazzi aren't allowed. Why come to the U.S. and come into Hollywood and sign a Netflix deal and sign a book deal and sign a Spotify podcast deal? if you want a private life and you don't want to be scrutinized by the public and by the media. Anybody that puts themselves out there will get scrutinized by the public. I put myself out there, I get scrutinized by people every single day. Not at that level, but I know that there's going to be love and there's going to be hate. And trust me, I get a lot of hate, but I don't go out there, cry and play a victim about it. Again, that's not to compare my level to their level, but still it's like, I wouldn't, if I didn't like the hate that I was getting, I wouldn't continue being on YouTube. I wouldn't continue being on social media. I wouldn't continue doing a podcast. If I couldn't take it, if I couldn't take the heat, I would get out of the kitchen. Then we get into a whole segment about immigration in the UK and how the UK is racist and how this must be why they hate Megan, right? Just like, you know, we just talked about how they loved Megan when she became engaged to Harry and they discuss how the palace is trying to evolve, but that their country is not ready to be progressive. And Megan talks about how hard it was, but how the palace was telling her that eventually it'll die down. You just have to ride through it right now, even though it's intense right now, just kind of hang on and it'll get better. But my thing too, is it's like, you can't sign up to be a janitor and then complain about having to scrub toilets. Don't be a janitor then. It's not glamorous. Or sometimes you sign up for things that have glamour, but that doesn't mean that it's always going to be a perfect picture. And something as grand as being part of the royal family, it's not all glitz and glamour. You know, it's not all glitz and glam. It's not all diamonds and rosé. Never has been, never will be. And again, they talk about being loved and they keep driving this idea of being visually attacked relentlessly, which is confusing. Were you loved or were you attacked relentlessly? It's very hard to hear two entitled, rich, wealthy people living in a nine bathroom mansion whining about how difficult their lives are. Yeah. Did you notice the way they were so careful not to talk bad about the queen or Charles or any other key members of the royal family? No, they completely leave them out. I'm curious if we get into that in part two, which are the, the last three episodes, which we'll break down next week. Just maybe the Brits were just not sold on her. Why would you be sold on her? He's he's a party boy that's only been dating her for a few weeks, or sorry, for a few months, and she's an American actress who has no concept of what royal life is. You know, like, of course, you're going to be a little skeptical. I send you love, Zach Peter. Oh, thank you. I was like, wait, why are you sending me love? Are you saying that my heart is 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 hard? Um, but you're, I'm assuming you're referencing the the hate that I get on social. But listen, I don't let it get to me. Again, not to compare myself to them, but like I'm on a teeny tiny minuscule level compared to them. But like, it's just like I wouldn't continue to put myself out. And I know people put themselves out there and they can't take the heat. So they get out of the kitchen or people who would rather pander and craft their message. And, you know, because of that, they get more love than I do. It just it's all a game and we're all playing this game and we all know what we sign up for. Also, they talk about the point where the press turned on them. They also, they talk about the point where the press turned on them. It seems like we go back and forth about it, though. 
um, about whether the press loved them or hated them because they make it seem. And if that's the case, then work that into the into the um, the storyline of it all. Work that into the chronological storyline of when the press turned on them. Don't tell us immediately out the gate from episode one all the way to the end of episode one and then episode two and all the way to the end of episode two, how hard and how awful the press was to you. Talk about that turning point. In episode two, again, they're really trying to push this Diana comparison very hard. And then we get into the, the how racist the UK is. And we get another learning lesson on how the Caribbean was, the, was basically the dirty south of Great Britain. And we get into British slavery and how it was worse than it was in the US. I wasn't aware of that. Um, and I'm also not entirely familiar with British culture, which I found interesting. Um, I find it interesting. We really play up how the race card was not a thing for Megan um, because she had a fair complexion and she didn't really struggle with race before, but yet now it's all become about race for Megan, not necessarily about being black, but about her being uh, uh, mixed and how racist everybody was to her. I thought that the point of the documentary was to be about Megan and Harry's story and to tell their truth. But we're getting a lot of these lectures that basically educate us on why the UK is racist and why they have these dark racial undertones that are part of the fabric of the UK, which I think is interesting. And I'm learning a lot through it. But again, the, the documentary is called Meghan and Harry. So tell us the story of Meghan and Harry. But when you teach us these, you know, these lessons about British history, it's to try and sell us this narrative and they're trying very hard to sell us this narrative. I don't think this documentary needed to be six parts. I think it could have been at best four, three would have been perfect. Again, what is your truth? What is your story? What are you like? Why are you trying to lecture us about the racist undertones of the UK and using gossip magazines to fuel that narrative? The UK has a racist background. And again, I'm pretty sure these are all things that people would find interesting in the documentary, but not, about the Meghan and Harry documentary. I just found it interesting for sure. I learned a lot. It's opened my eyes a lot. I'm kind of glad that it's, you know, kind of taught me a couple of new things, but you know, could this now be the royal family catching up on the times? I don't know. But then we get back to them being embraced by the Brits and how the Brits really loved them when they first found out about Meghan. So it's an odd juxtaposition. It, it goes back and forth quite a lot. Do they like her or are they racist and they all hate her? Then we get into another lesson on the Rhoda. We're learning a lot about British culture in this documentary. Thank you, Netflix. So the Rhoda is a select group of British media that have been designed, or sorry, that have been designated to cover the royal family. And the royals and their families are their topics. And they believe that they're entitled to unlimited access to them because they're part of this Rhoda that's designated to cover the royals. And now the royal family lives off of the Commonwealth not forget that right so i can kind of see how there is the sense of entitlement you don't have to like it i don't like it but i understand where that sense of entitlement comes from because they're paying for their lives you know as a member of the royal family i don't know how comfortable i'd be with that it does feel very invasive but i guess that's the double-edged sword you choose when becoming a royal or not even choose you can feel bad for the members that are royals but when you marry into that family you're choosing this life you know, they describe how ruthless the British press was. And again, the British press and the ruthlessness is not specific to Megan. That's just the British press, which they're very clear to, to mention, but like still try to make it seem like Megan was different in some way. We get into how awful Megan's father's family was and how they would talk to the press. Megan says that she doesn't really know her older sister, Samantha. However, Samantha says that they were actually very close until about 2018. And she says that the media has fabricated some of her quotes and that she didn't really say everything that the media has attributed to her. I don't like Samantha. I think Samantha's a little thirsty. Didn't she write a book? I'm not a fan of Samantha, her older half-sister. Um, but then it gets weird because Megan was clear that she does not know Samantha, didn't really know her, doesn't know her birthday, doesn't know Samantha's middle name, like really cannot be bothered by her. Yet then we meet Samantha's daughter, right? Ashley. And so Megan says that when her dad told her that Samantha reconnected with her daughter, Ashley, because Ashley was actually raised by her paternal grandparents, but I guess reconnected with Samantha later in life. And so Megan's father disclosed, oh, Samantha, your older half-sister, has gotten back in touch with Ashley. 
And that's when Megan claimed that she told her dad, oh, well, that's great. I would love to reach out to Ashley. And they instantly became pen pals. And I'm like, isn't that a little weird? Why would you want to connect with the daughter of some half-sister you do not know and want nothing to do with? That I found incredibly strange and fishy. And she apparently became very close with Ashley and they traveled together and they drank together. And it's just, it's very strange why this relationship was forged by Megan when she says that she has no connection to Samantha. She doesn't even know Samantha's middle name. She doesn't know Samantha's birthday. You know, it seems that Samantha was not happy about Megan getting close to her daughter and Ash and Samantha seem to have had some sort of falling out. Just weird. Then we talk about Harry's Nazi Halloween costume. We're jumping over there. And how he feels badly about that. And he went to a Holocaust museum and he talked to multiple survivors and he's learned from that experience and he's a changed man and he's a better man because of it. And then we get into a peek at Harry's military life and how impactful those years were for him. We get a lot more of Megan's activism and her speaking up for women and how Megan was more active in her philanthropic work. The other women in the royal family apparently pick charities that don't come with controversy. So that was a, a little bit of a lightning rod for the royal family as well, where it really showcases that Meghan has a lot more, you know, liberal beliefs and liberal roots. And so it's a lot more, you know, she's a lot more forward with her opinions. And she's like, I didn't know that that was a thing that we were a little more frugal with. They showed how Megan was definitely changing tradition, which I think is good and I think is necessary. I think we need to push the needle forward. Um, listen, she and Kate are part of the future of the royal family alongside their husbands. So marrying into it, it does make sense that they're moving it in a different direction. Evolution is natural. And I think it's good again, to help push that needle forward. Um, but there was some ridicule for her being American in a British game, which I get. She didn't know many of the protocols, nor did anybody really teach them to her. She said she had to Google a lot of it. She says that she just wanted to blend in and try to fit in. She says that she didn't want to embarrass the family. And my, have we really changed that tune? Because all she does is not blend in and use the royal family and put gas on the fire and embarrass them at every single chance she gets. Zach, they didn't move directly to the U.S. They moved to Vancouver Island before they even announced leaving the royal family. We're very protective of Harry, so they were able to live here quietly. Yes, but my point is, why then move to the to the U.S. and to Hollywood at all? I'm, I know that wasn't a direct move from the U.K. to the U.S., but if this is the narrative that you're trying to sell, that we don't like the press, we don't like the paparazzi, we don't like the media, social media is mean to us, we just want to live a quiet, private life, then why eventually make the move to tell this story? Go to Dubai and don't do any press interviews. I agree. The knee story was very strange. They were supposed to be close. It was, and she wasn't invited to the wedding. Yeah, we'll get into that. Princess Margaret, Prince Charles, Diana, Prince Andrew, and Fergie all received terrible press at times. Prince Edward, you never hear about. Yeah. Um. Then her niece Ashley says that she lost communication with her. Megan uh, became less in contact as she got more enamored in, in the royal life. Then we talk about the press houses who served as the middleman between the family and the press. And they were under a lot of pressure, Megan says, because they were going through a lot. But then there were all the reports that Megan was very demanding of them and that they had a quick turnaround because a lot of the members were reporting that Megan was abusive or just like hostile towards them. And a lot of them were quitting. He worked for both Megan and Harry and Kate and William. So, I mean, juggling both of them, I imagine, is kind of tough being that they were. That's why I think they try to make them the core four. Like the four of them is one solid unit rather than the separation. But it definitely seems like there was a clear separation, especially as it started to get out that, that uh, Megan and Kate didn't get along. Then we get back into Ashley and why Ashley, who's Samantha's daughter, Megan's niece, half niece, wasn't invited to the wedding. Apparently it was per the advice of the palace. I think it was kind of shitty, but they said that they couldn't have Ashley there because Samantha wasn't invited and it would be weird if Samantha came and, and her mother wasn't there, even though her mother was um, Megan's half sister. <sighs> yeah. Um, and then there's all this you know, excitement around the wedding and the wedding's coming up and a lot of people are excited. And I'm like, okay, so did the Commonwealth like her and they were excited about the wedding or they hated her and they weren't excited about the wedding? 
I'm confused because then we get into the privilege of the Commonwealth and how they're all very privileged and we get into the queen and how the queen is basically running, running empire 2.0 and how the Commonwealth hasn't really changed. And all they've done is get better PR and Megan doesn't really like their PR because they kept quitting on her apparently, but there was hope that Megan could radicalize the Commonwealth. And I agree. I think America, uh, Megan being American and being an actress, being a mixed race woman, more liberal i think it definitely pushed the palace to be more modern um and maybe that was a bit jarring and usually when you do something like that and it is a bit jarring you are going to get a bit of pushback what is their end game in all of this that's the biggest question truly that is really the biggest question in all of this prince edward and sarah kept keep a very low profile yeah so if edward and sarah can keep a low profile and stay under the radar so can Megan and Harry. Then we get into Megan's dad and how he was staging photos to make a hundred to make money, and he made a hundred thousand dollars for staging photos. Dirty, gross. Not a fan of the dad. He seems very slimy. Um, Tom Bauer in his books seemed to try to give him the benefit of the doubt, and he told he allowed Thomas to tell his side of the story. I still don't really believe his side of the story. He claimed that he had a heart attack and couldn't attend the wedding. Megan claims that she tried to reach out to him over and over and over. And then finally, after the heart attack and after the, as the wedding was approaching, you know, he texted her back saying, sorry that my heart attack was an inconvenience to you. And then she was like, oh no, his phone must've been compromised. This isn't my dad. This, these aren't his text messages. They claim that they never spoke on the phone after this. I thought it was also strange. Like, why was he dodging their calls? Why wasn't he answering the phone? He was talking to TMZ and told TMZ he wasn't going to be at the wedding. I feel like the dad is just a bit shady. And that's kind of where episode three leaves. And then episode four is where we get into the wedding, but we'll cover that next week. I enjoy seeing their love story. I will say that. I definitely enjoy seeing them meeting and falling in love. I think Megan is gorgeous. I think she has killer fashion style. I think she's way better style than Kate does. I think the documentary is a little too long. I was kind of like exhausted by all three of these parts. I feel like this could have been condensed into possibly one part or maybe a part and a half. I don't think, I think the whole thing could have been three episodes. It does not need to be six episodes, especially because a lot of it is driving this Diana comparison, selling this on how horrible the media is and then all of these lectures about why the uk is so problematic um and i think those three pieces aren't necessarily necessary for no kate is absolutely is absolutely elegant but i just mean in terms of fashion sense i like megan's fashion personally more than kate's fashion kate is very regal and kate is very you know looks great Megan, i just feel like has a bit more of like a modern flair and twist to it so i like Megan's fashion style. It's a little bit more of my preference versus Kate. Nothing against Kate. I'm not knocking Kate at all. I think Kate is a fabulous, gorgeous woman as well. Megan McCain had a great article in the Daily Mail about what this may have been and it's all about. Oh, what did she say, Shishi? Megan is gorgeous. Prince Andrew might deserve all the bad press he's getting. Yeah. And yeah, warranted. Their end game is to fake everybody out. Okay, so let's get into what some of the reactions were. Because a lot of people had a lot of different reactions. And I want to get into some of these that I kind of agree with. And these were my takeaways from it as well. I know people are going to be mad, but we're going to talk about Bethany Frankel. Because I, I actually agree with her. I don't agree with everything she says. I don't agree with all of her TikToks and all of the shit that she puts out. But I actually happen to agree with her about the Meghan and Harry stuff. So this is what Beth Bethany said after watching part one of the documentary, which were these three episodes. So Bethany says, it felt like the entire documentary was about how famous we are. And it was relentless. If you're being trolled by the media, the royal family gave you advice to say nothing because that's the advice that most very famous people are given. If you add gasoline to the fire, the fire blows up even bigger. It feels like they and Megan in particular just want to keep telling us more. I agree. If you want to live a more private life, then, you know, you can't also do a documentary and a book and a podcast. Go live in Dubai where there's no paparazzi. If it's really that much for you, if it's too much to handle, if it's too hot to handle, get out of the kitchen. You can't want to be part of the royal family, but also not want to fulfill the royal duties. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Bethany added, um, it feels like get the grab the bag because we're leaving this thing and we got to take everything we can. I agree. They left. And it definitely feels like they're trying to milk it for everything they absolutely can, especially since it seems like they had an agreement with the with royal family and the palace that they weren't going to try and monetize 
like why monetize off the royal family? Why even consider calling yourselves the Duke and Duchess of Sussex if you don't want to be part of any of this life? Bethany also talks about Diana, saying that they really wanted to push the Princess Diana aspect, the comparison, and I feel like it achieved the opposite result because Diana was there five, six, seven times longer than Meghan and entered the monarchy when she was 19, and it's just not the same comparison. I agree with Bethany. Megan, she continues, Megan walked into the monarchy, a divorcee, older and a woman of color. Wallace Simpson was with the Duke of Windsor, who abdicated the throne. And she was a Jewish woman who was divorced. And both of those elements continued to or contributed to it being controversial. I agree with Bethany. They're really trying to push this Diana comparison on us. And I feel like it really is not necessarily the same Thing. They didn't like Diana for very different reasons than why they don't like Meghan and Harry, or mostly Meghan. Sharon Osborne weighed in. She said, I was totally bored by the whining, the whining, the whining. And you know, the curtsy and the whole thing she said about medieval times, the lunch with the queen was like medieval times, which, you know, is a Disney type entertainment place for kids. It's just so horribly disrespectful and a wine fest. I mean, is Harry's book going to be the same thing? Everything has been about Everything has been abused by the public, by the press, by the royal family. Well, well, oh, she says, everything has been abused by the public, by the press, by the royal family. Well, what do you, well, what do you what? Well, do you know what? You have a great life. You have a beautiful family and you are so much in love. Move on, get a life and move on. I agree. Get a life and move on if you want to be out of it. You want to get away so badly. But yet they can't seem to stop talking about it so much. And here they are monetizing it from every single angle. Harry's book comes out next year. Howard Stern criticized it too. He said, I couldn't, he said, I wouldn't stay with it, but my wife wants to watch it. You know, we have shows we watch, but they come off as just such whiny bitches. I got to tell you, man, I just don't get it. I get Prince Harry being pissed off at the monarchy for his mother. They treated her like shit. I feel bad for Prince Harry losing his mother and all that. You got my empathy there. But Jesus Christ, when those two start whining about wah, 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 and they don't like me, and Meghan wants to be loved in this country, but man, oh man, it's like the Kardashians except boring. Kathy Griffin said, I'm disappointed. I thought that this was going to be a great love story. Meghan kind of acts like she was never on deal or no deal. And when, she, and when I say kind of acts like, I mean, they don't even acknowledge it at all, which is kind of hilarious to me. You don't think it's funny when Meghan acts like she doesn't know what hair and makeup is. Exactly. This is Meghan being very mindful and crafting of her image. We got no mention of her dating Chef Corey when she was... Uh, first talking to Harry, we get no mention of deal or no deal because she was like, oh, that's beneath me. I was an actress and a philanthropist and that's the story I'm going to sell you guys. And I, I actually, I don't particularly care for Kathy Griffin all the time, but I agree. She acts like she doesn't know what hair and makeup is. And that is the life that she grew up in. She wanted to be an actress. She grew up on the set. And then I think the best part is Bethany's closing argument here. And she says, look, you got the money. You got the attention that you didn't want, but you do want. So what is the goal? So if you want to, ta if you want to tackle women's issues and racism, why don't do a documentary about that? Why not talk about that? It seems like the biggest topic you're talking about is this one family, the monarchy, that you're telling us is archaic and that we already knew. Can we be done now because we did it, we got it, we heard it, and it feels like this documentary was designed to garner sympathy, and it just seems like it's achieving the opposite result. I almost got sucked into the sympathy. I almost wanted to buy into it, and I almost wanted to feel for them, and I'm just like, I can't. I don't. Next week's part two, where we'll recap episodes four through six, which is the wedding and all of the aftermath, the Oprah interview, all of that. Um... I agree with Bethany and Sharon Osborne. Piers Morgan, obviously not a fan of this one as well. Um, yeah, I stand with Bethany and Megan McCain on this one. I do too. Poor Corey, still sad for him. I, I feel worse for Corey than I do for Megan. Corey still has to get dragged into all of this. Megan chose this life. Megan McCain thinks this is a smear campaign on the world against the Royals. I agree. I agree. That's all it is. It's a smear campaign against the Royals in an effort to make us look good. And that's what I think is gross about it.
that's what I don't like is it's like we're trying to tear down the monarchy to make us look like victims so that we can monetize off of that. Because if this is your story, you told us your story in your Oprah interview. Why are you telling us another story where Netflix is paying you what a reported $20 million to do a six part docuseries and they have more documentaries that they plan to release with Netflix in the future. I agree. It's a cash grab and we're trying to milk the monarchy for all we can while we take it down with us. It's all ego. It's all ego. I almost felt bad for them. I almost fell for their love story. We didn't get enough of their love story. And I don't think there's anything to feel bad for them about. I just don't. Drag me, hate me. Maybe you don't like me. Anybody that's out there and they're like, oh my God, it's such a good documentary. And I'm not, you're falling for it. You're letting them manipulate you. You're letting them gaslight you into thinking what their, their version of the truth is the only truth. And like someone mentioned in the live chat earlier, there are three parts to the truth. His side, her side, and the actual truth. I totally agree with them. They need to say their side of the story. The hate and racism from the press and the media in London will never end. They wanted the family to support them, and they did it. No. Constituent pay, and they expose. Tyler Perry is a big supporter of both of them, helped them get to L.A. and provided housing for them. Yes, and he's no longer a supporter of them. I learned that in Tom Bauer's book. He supported them, and then they were apparently awful to his staff, and he has since cut ties with them, from what I remember. Do you think they will overthrow William? No. I will admit, I feel less sorry for them the more, the more time goes on. I think the more time that passes, the more people investigate the details. The thing is, they want to tell their truth, and they leave out key context, and they leave out key details. And that's what makes me suspicious of them. Piers Morgan, Morgan is vicious to them. Piers Morgan is, is vicious regardless. I love how they act like they just discovered racism. But yeah, they just discovered racism. They are the very first victims of tabloid culture. You know, it just, it's insane. It's insane. Tom Bauer wrote the book called Revenge. He's a reporter out in, he's a, a British reporter. They're race baiting. I think, I agree. Here's the thing. I actually believe that Harry believes and wants to be better and wants to make sure he creates a better world for his children. I do. I believe his phil his philanthropic work more than hers because I feel like he came from this very privileged life and he was given everything. And now he probably has a lot of guilt. And usually when people do a lot of that charity work, it's that projected guilt of like, I live a privileged life. I want to give back. Megan, on the other hand, it does kind of seem like she's used her philanthropic work to advance her career. We learned a lot more about it in Tom Bauer's book when she was doing the L articles and she was using, you know, all these basically using these charity, um, these charity trips in other countries to be, you know, photo shoots that she was using for her own personal gain. I think she likes the attention. I really do. I think she's addicted to the attention. And listen, I think their love story is compelling enough. You don't have to bring down the the monarchy with you. I think she's trying to be the Leah Remini of Scientology, and that's what she's trying to do. That's what they're both trying to do with the royal family. And I think part of her intentions may be genuine, right? I just don't believe it all. And that's where I stand. All right, guys. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining our Tuesday night recaps. Um, we have to come up with a fun name for what we want to call the recaps moving forward. I think they've done more as royals to help people. It's like now that she's an American with her prince and Oprah's neighbor. What have they done more to help people as royals? I mean, maybe that's true. Are they friends with Amber Heard? Yeah. I mean, listen, Amber Heard's a great activist too. She was out there pledging all her divorce money. Just because people say it doesn't mean it's true. Tyler Perry's no longer supports them. They were awful to his staff details. I don't remember the exact details. Either it was in Tom Bauer's book or something that was read recently, but I, I do remember him kind of distancing himself from them. They don't just leave out details. They out and... They, they straight out lie yeah, to look good. Um, I think they left out key parts because they were trying so hard not to bash anyone in the royal family. No, they left out key parts to make themselves look better. Meghan dating somebody while she meets Prince Harry is a pretty big key detail, but we totally reframed that into Meghan being like she was having a hot girl single summer. 
I'm 100% with you, Zach. I'm not with it. Um, she's what I think of when I think of an LA person, someone who always want, who's always looking at all the angles. Yeah. They originally moved to the Commonwealth country, Canada, so that they could fulfill their royal duties and not be living in the UK. Exactly. But you can't have your cake and eat it too, Carolyn. You're either part of the royal family and you get the privileges of being part of the royal family and you fulfill your royal duties, or you don't. There is no middleman. And if the palace is like, we're not willing to do this cake and eat it too deal, then you have to be out. And when you're out, you're out. You don't go and trash the family on your way out. I actually understand why Prince William is pissed and why he's so pissed that they used the Diana Tello BBC interview in this as well to paint their picture of how awful things were for Diana. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks as always, brilliant back. Um, helped uh, all of you helped me enjoy and pass the time while making spaghetti. Oh, I want spaghetti. Yum. That sounds so yummy. Social climber. I agree. Do I want dinner? I had, what did I have? I had a salad for lunch, a big salad. So I'm not like wildly hungry, but I kind of want like something. Okay. Anyway, thank you guys for joining tonight's book club. We're going to think of a new name for it. Uh, review or review something with review or something with recaps, right? Because we're reviewing books and we're reviewing documentaries. So we'll come up with a name about it. But thank you guys. If you want to give me a follow, you can keep up with me personally. If you give a shit at just plain Zach, I do like the public life. I do like you, you know, asking me about my dating life and my personal life. You're more than welcome to pry into that. I just posted our family Christmas card on my personal Instagram account. It's a lot of fun. We did a rap song. So that's available at justplainzack.com. Um, or if you want to keep up with the podcast and you want to stay up to date with all the latest pop culture tea, you can follow at No Filter with Zach. Subscribe on YouTube. Hit the like button on your way out if you enjoyed. Leave a comment below letting me know your thoughts or letting me know if you have a fun name for what we're going to call our Tuesday recaps. It was great, the Christmas card. Thank you, PLN. Um, yeah. Hot tea recaps. Ooh, that's fun. Thanks, Zach. They reframe everything. Yes, they do. All right, guys. I love you. I appreciate you. And I will talk to you soon. Um, I don't think there'll be a new episode of the podcast on Wednesday. Maybe I might upload this recap to the podcast and see how people react to it and see how people, what they think about it. Um, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but yeah. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And I hope you have a very, um, did you sell out of the limited edition wine this weekend? I believe we have a couple orders left. So if you want to go to nofilterwine.com, you can stock up on, I always make it nice. And oh my God, I'm lit holiday collection. Great for the new year. This is a great, uh, champagne replacement. The, I always make it nice white wine. Cause it's fizzy. And so it's like champagne, but there's no sugar in it. Or there's the rosé, which is always yummy. They make great mimosas for when you're hungover. And these limited edition cans will be gone after the holidays. So be sure to stock up on them now at nofilterwine.com. Thank you guys for all the love and support of the No Filter Wine. I appreciate you. I love you. And I will talk to you uh, Thursday night. We'll be doing our regular Thursday night live. So stay tuned for that. All right. Love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.